Welcome, uh, my name is Guilherme Melo and I'm here at Fundação Comercial Abramo with Professor Kostas Lapavitsas, a Greek political economist and it's a pleasure to receive you here in Brazil, in Fundação Comercial Abramo and we want to talk a little bit about economics, the situation in Greece, in the Eurozone and in Brazil of course. Uh, Mr. Lapovic, in 2013 you wrote a book called Profit Without Production, uh, How Finance Exploit Us All. Uh, in this book you analyze what some economists call financialization or finance dominance. Uh, that is very different from the previous forms of capitalism, especially the one that predominates uh, in the aftermath of the Second Great War. Could, it, uh, uh, could you explain to us what exactly is financialization and how it changed the conduct of the re and, and the relations between social agents and social classes? First of all, let me thank the uh, Foundation for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to have this discussion. It's a great pleasure and an honor for me. And I hope that what we say will be useful. Um, to the foundation, but also more broadly um, to the movement in Brazil. Now, um, financialization is, um, I think, the most interesting uh, new idea that has come out in uh, political economy uh, that um, describes what has happened in capitalism the last three, four decades. Um, and it, it, it's emerged, this idea has emerged uh, basically since the uh, middle of the 90s. Now, I'll tell you what I think it is and how I have um, discussed it in my works. I believe it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a period change. It's a change in the historical development of capitalism that we can, we can begin to see um, emerging in the late 1970s. So it's four decades now. Um, on the face of it, it represents uh, the incredible growth of finance compared to the rest of the economy. Um, the change in the balance between finance and the productive sector. So that's clear, it's, it's evident. But more analytically, from my perspective, I think it's three tendencies. This historical period is characterized by three tendencies, three interrelated tendencies. The first, is the transformation of the productive enterprise. The productive enterprise, especially the big businesses, have become financialized. In other words, they have um, huge amounts of liquid capital, which they use for financial activities, and they extract profit from financial operations uh, rather than simply from production. That's the first and most fundamental um, step. The second, the banks have changed because if productive business uh, changes, the banks will also change. The banks have actually moved um, slightly away from big business. They have fewer opportunities to lend to big business compared to before. And what the banks do now is transact in open markets and make profits out of financial transactions. And they also lend to individuals, households and so on. And the third tendency is related to these previous two, and that is financialization of households and workers, individual workers. The uh, absorption, the inclusion of um, wage workers and other, other, other uh, layers of the uh, population into uh, the realm of finance, both on the side of debt, debt growing, but also on the side of assets um, for, for, for pensions uh, and so on. Now, the, the combination of these three tendencies, for me, defines uh, financialization as a new period in the um, evolution of capitalism. Two more points on this. The ideology of this period, the dominant and appropriate ideology of this period is neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is the ideology that fits this change. It's the ideology that comes primarily out of the financial sector. Um, and seems to uh, match its uh, requirements. And the second point is that none of all this 
would have been possible without support and reliance on the state. The state itself has supported financialization and has become implicated in financialization uh, increasingly. Okay, the, the second question is that apparently uh, the power of finance don't change only the economical process like banks, households, enterprises, but also change the balance of power in politics. Uh, a lot of social science, not only economists, uh, are exploring this relationship between economic financial power and uh, political power. How do you see this relationship between finance and democracy? Are they compatible? I want first of all to say that um, we have to be more careful about the power of finance. Financialization is also about the financialization of big business, big productive business. So, um, um, so it isn't as if the banks uh, dictate everything. That is not what is happening. Um, the banks are, of course, very important. Whenever finance grows, they're very important. But the banks relate very closely to um, big commercial and uh, uh, industrial enterprises. So it's not as if we have a situation in which the big banks dictate terms to uh, big business. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's a matter of breaking the power of the banks to liberate big business. Such a thing is not is not really the reality of modern capitalism. We've got considerable power of finance, but that is mixed with the power of um, uh, big commercial and industrial enterprises in promoting their interests through uh, a variety of measures to do with uh, financialization. Now, this has, has had a tremendous impact on politics. A tremendous impact on politics. The, and and the, that impact has become clearer over time. And it's very, very clear in Europe, no doubt we will discuss that in a minute. But um, what we see is, as financialization has progressed, it's now four decades, parliamentary democracy has increasingly lost content. It doesn't really express uh, any longer the interests, even electorally, the interests of working people and the poor. Because it, doesn't, uh, because it doesn't affect at all redistribution. It, it, redistribution has been blocked. So parliamentary de democracy is not at all redistributive. It's all about uh, the letter of the law. It's all about um, uh, legal practice uh, and so on. And that has detached parliamentary de uh, democracy from the uh, desires, the needs and so on of working people in m many countries, in mature capitalism and in developing capitalism. This has meant that um, parliamentary democracy has lost um, credibility. Um, and in that context, what we've seen is increasing power of uh, big business, large financial conglomerates, and people associated with that, particularly when they've got access to the media. And these powerful centers manipulate uh, the democratic process and the political process in, in a variety of countries, uh, including in the main uh, capitalist countries, the, the, the core of the, of the system. And there, what we see is the rise of a kind of autocracy or autocratic practice that pretends to be democratic, uses the, uses the mechanisms of democracy, but hasn't got any of the content of redistributive uh, democracy that we saw uh, in the decades after the Second World War. Um, this is an untenable situation. This is an untenable situation because it's basically class-based, class-ridden, um, um, and it promotes inequality. Um, it, it is the political, the political side of the rising inequality and loss of power by working people that we've seen in the last um, three, four decades. Uh, we, we talk about how fi financialization changes big business, banks, households, and politics. But I want to talk a little bit about how financialization changes the role of the state. Uh, because uh, the free flow of huge masses of financial capital uh, turns the exchange rate very unstable uh, and creates new forms of repressing the power of national states uh, in defining its monetary and fiscal policies. Uh, like li limiting that ratio or uh, uh, to the rating agents
sciences and things like that. What do you think are, uh, are the role of national states in contemporary capitalism? Are there any way uh, they can create a local or national alternative to financialization? The question of the role of the nation state today, together with the question of democracy and democratic uh, practice and representation, uh, is the most uh, important political question for our time, political and institutional question. The two are connected. Democracy and the role of the nation state um, are very closely connected, uh, as we've seen the last few years. It's not true that um, financialization um, and the emergence of global financial capital has destroyed the power of the state. That is not true. Um, the, the great crisis of 2007-2009 in the United States showed us very, very clearly that um, financialization in the United States and in a number of other uh, large countries depends absolutely on the state. Without the state, it, it's inconceivable. The state has basically supported finance. Finance begged the state uh, to, to, to intervene, and the state did. And, and, and a fundamental reason why the state was able to do it is because the period of financialization has been a period of complete monopoly over uh, legal tender, uh, fiat money. This is, this is a historic period in the, in the development of capitalism. It's the first time we've seen more than 40 years of complete fiat money um, absolutely monopolized by the state. This gives the state huge power. The state today is um, arguably more powerful than at any other time in the history of capitalism um, in, in terms of what it can do. Uh, the state also, in the United States and elsewhere, has become hugely indebted. It has acquired tremendous amounts of debt in order to support finance. So both on account of money and on account of public debt, the state is a pillar of financialization. Uh, it can do many things. It chooses to do certain things. It chooses to do or not to do certain things. Uh, it, it's not as if it cannot. The state is hugely powerful, but it chooses to do certain things. Now, the role of the state in developed countries, uh, the core countries of the system, and in developing countries or the peripheral kinds of the countries of the system is, of course, very different. So what the state can do in Brazil or what the state can do in Greece is very different to what it can do in uh, Germany or it can do in um, the United States. For us, though, for those who seek um, a radical alternative to financialization and to capitalism, for those who believe in overturning capitalism, one thing is clear. The nation state remains a fundamental lever in achieving our aims. We've learned this the last seven or eight years. We've seen it uh, after the great crisis. If you don't control certain uh, levers of the, of the state, you cannot intervene effectively uh, at all in the economy, and you cannot defend democracy. Control over the nation state, of course, does not allow you to do everything that you would like. We need internationalism, but without control over the state, uh, you've lost uh, from, from, from the word go. So I want to stress that. Uh, the issue today uh, for the left for those who want a radical, anti-capitalist, uh, socialist alternative, is to redefine the meaning of sovereignty, the meaning of control over the state, and to work out what the state can do for the working people and the popular strata in, 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 in the current conditions. Nice. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Europe and the Greek crisis. Uh, in 2002, 2012, you wrote a book called Crisis in the Eurozone that immediately turned in to be a reference on the critical assessments of the euro crisis. Uh, we know that the euro crisis is linked to the subprime crisis uh, that happened in 2008, but apparently the effects of the crisis is bigger in the eurozone than it was in the United States or other developed countries. What are the roots of the euro crisis and why the eurozone is facing greater difficulties in overcoming it? It is true that the eurozone crisis is a continuation of the great crisis of 
which was a financialization crisis. But financialization in Europe was refracted, mediated by the monetary union. It's a very important point to stress. Financialization is never the same uh, across the world. In Europe, it took particular forms because of the monetary union. So, uh, to cut a long story short, financialization in Germany, which exists, is actually quite different from financialization in the United States. Now, the Eurozone was created in the 90s. The original official political logic was um, we will create a unified monetary space and this will promote convergence uh, of the members of the monetary union and that will promote greater political uh, unity in the fullness um, of time. Um, what the Eurozone um, did was completely the opposite. It has created a situation in Europe whereby first neoliberalism, the ideology of financialization, has become embedded in the institutions of Europe. It is actually now institutionalized neoliberalism that we have in Europe. Uh, for the European Union as well, if you look at uh, competition policy, industrial strategy and so on. So it has allowed neoliberalism to become embedded, that's the first thing that the uh, European Monetary Union did. The second thing it did was of course to facilitate the incredible ascendancy of Germany. Um, the Monetary Union was not a plan by German big business, of course. Uh, but the way it has functioned, it has allowed uh, German exporters to gain tremendous competitive advantages within uh, the European market and then in relation to China and to the United States. Basically, the euro uh, has worked in the interest of German industrial exporters because uh, they kept wages down, they gained a competitive advantage in, in Europe, they dominated the European market uh, and then the crisis of the Eurozone kept the Euro down and allowed Germany to export then uh, competitively to China, uh, United States and, and elsewhere. So what the Eurozone has done in practice is to allow the German industrial complex, which basically is uh, cars, chemicals and machines, machine production, it has allowed the German industrial complex to emerge as the true core of um, Europe. And around this true core of Europe, we now have a series of peripheries. The Eurozone has recreated the core periphery um, division in Europe and has recreated it ferociously the last um, uh, two decades. Germany dominates. It has a ring of countries around it attached to its industrial um, uh, complex, uh, directly attached to it through foreign direct investment at times and it also has a number of other peripheries of countries which are not directly attached to, uh, to the German productive machine but uh, are loosely supplying it with labor and so on. This is what the financialization through the Eurozone has done uh, in Europe. Uh, in some ways it's the most peculiar development that we've seen the last two decades with um, uh, global repercussions. Uh, Germany has truly emerged now as a major player globally, not because of the size of its economy directly, but because it dominates uh, a number of other areas uh, around it. It has attached them, these areas to, to its own economy and now it's a global player. Um, we are going to see major uh, frictions uh, arising from this uh, event. We're already beginning to see them politically. We will see more in the years to come. Uh, you have been elected a congressman in the Atlantic Parliament in 2015, right? right? That's right. And originally you, you were elected by Syriza, but later you changed it to the Popular Unit. So you are an eyewit eyewitness uh, to the economic and political difficulties that Syriza and Greece is facing even today. 
How the Greek, Greek crisis is related to the Euro crisis, and why do Syriza, that originally was a new left-wing left -wing power, was unable to overcome the crisis and some some way adapted the Troika's recommendations? Um, Greece was the worst case of the Eurozone crisis. It isn't just, the, that was never just the Greek crisis. It was the Eurozone crisis, but it took a very severe form in Greece. Greece basically failed to compete and survive in the monetary union. And it was, it, it, it was the mirror image of the German success. German success meant uh, Greek failure and other countries, the failure of other countries, but Greece is the worst case. Now, I argued that in 2010, and my argument was that uh, the country could not survive in the monetary union. This was never uh, widely accepted, though. So when you look at Syriza, when you look at Syriza, which um, in 2010 was an insignificant little party uh, of the left, mm -hmm. just about succeeded in getting into parliament. Um, when you look at Syriza, you will see that um, within Syriza, there were always two, broadly speaking, two currents, broadly speaking. One, and the dominant one, represented by its leadership, was a current that believed that um, um, Europe has a problem, but that's not the monetary union and it's not German domination, uh, b uh, industrial or other domination. It is neoli neoliberalism and austerity. And uh, the argument was that um, if Syriza succeeds politically, it could, then, uh, it could then go to Brussels or go to Berlin or wherever, backed by the um, political legitimacy from elections, and make a strong argument uh, to the powers of, uh, of Europe and persuade them that Greece needed a, a different policy, not austerity, and a policy that would allow it to expand the economy and give it some debt relief. And uh, as well, the argument by Syriza would, and this presumed success, would allow it to change uh, the practices of Europe as well. There was, this was the dominant current, and he was determined not to get out of the monetary union at any cost. There was another current within Syriza, the left of Syriza, significant, substantial, which argued that this is impossible. Um, Europe is structured in a way that favors the interests of the core, the lenders and so on. The, the, the monetary union works in favor of the lenders and we need to, uh, be, to prepare for exit. Uh, I, at, I attached myself to the second current. I never belonged to Syriza. I was never a member of Syriza. Uh, actually, I come, I come from the left of Syriza uh, in, in terms of my own development. Um, but Syriza became very important politically, so I supported it. I supported this current within Syriza, and we battled. We, we had a fight. We had a fight because most of the political fighting in Greece in, in 2015 happened within Syriza. We lost. Now, you can, you can blame us and we can discuss why we lost, but we lost. The side uh, of the leadership, Tsipras and so on, won. And as they won, they also failed. They won the political struggle, but then they realized that uh, what they had argued and what they had proposed to the Greek people was simply not doable. They had the wrong idea about Europe, about politics in Europe, about what was feasible. They had completely misunderstood, and, and I'm being generous, I'm being polite. They had completely misjudged uh, what Europe was about, and they realized that against them, they had powerful institutions of uh, uh, financial and industrial power, lenders who would not uh, yield, and uh, there was no argument, and they were demolished, they were destroyed. What's remarkable about it, and I think that's it's the first time this has happened in the history of the left, these people, the leadership of Syriza, who had won the election 
on the promise of social change and new hope and a new party and so on, once they had realized that their political analysis was utterly incorrect, they turned around and adopted the policies of the lenders, the policies of the opposition. I don't think we've seen this in the history of the left. In two centuries of the history of the left in Europe, we haven't seen this before. We have seen the left promise things and not deliver. Do promise 10 things and do two. We've seen that many times. We've seen the left promise one thing and uh, forget it. We've seen that. But we've never seen the left promise to do certain things, fight for them, get the popular vote, get the government, and then turn around and do what the opposition uh, wants. That we've never seen before. Uh, and it's, it's a disgrace. It's a terrible disaster for the left. And the, the, the moral implications and the political implications will become clear over time, over time. Yeah. Uh, your, your critical view of the Eurozone has made some people classifying your position or position like that as eurosceptic. Uh, the same word is used to define some right-wing movements uh, as Le Pen in France uh, or the Brexit campaign in the United Kingdom. How do you do your position differs from these right wing movements, and why would Greece, Greece profit by leaving the Eurozone? Historically, you know, the most Eurosceptic part of the political spectrum in Europe was the left. Historically, mm -hmm. when the European Union was first um, proposed and started to happen, the left or good parts of the left, were very strongly skeptical and rejectionist. The real change, the real transformation, and the really interesting point in the issue that you brought up is not whether some people on the left are Eurosceptic and some people on the right are Eurosceptic. The real issue is when did the majority of the European left become so strongly Europhile? You know, that's the real question. Because you look at a number of countries and the, the core, the heart of the left in many of those countries uh, could not even think of rejecting the uh, monetary union and the European um, Union. It's remarkable. It's remarkable because these institutions, the European Union and the monetary union, are capitalist institutions created by the capitalist class of, of Europe, by big business, big banks and so on, to further their interests. These are not projects that began from the bottom up. These were projects that were always created from the top and imposed on those below. And the left, or much of the left, uh, somehow has forgotten this and is Europhile, thinks that the European Union somehow is inherently progressive. It's not. It's not. There's nothing inherently progressive about the European Union. Now, when you start with this, okay, it frees you. You're freer to, 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 to rediscover much of the genuine radicalism that Europe needs. Now, my argument is very simple. Radical change in favor of labor and against capital, a shifting in the balance of class forces and political forces in Europe in favor of labor and in the direction of socialism is impossible within the monetary union and it is impossible without confronting directly the mechanisms and policies of the European Union itself. These are neoliberal institutions thoroughly, and they cannot be changed. That's the lesson of Syriza. Syriza tried to change them from within and failed completely. Therefore, radical left positions must almost by definition be Eurosceptic. We must reject what exists in Europe in terms of these institutions. If you do that, necessarily you will stress again the importance of sovereignty, popular sovereignty, national sovereignty, the role of the nation state, the things that we discussed uh, a few minutes ago with regard to the rest of the world. This is fundamental. The left has, in Europe has overemphasized how bad the nation state is and uh, it has imagined that you can find radical solutions and, 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 and you can implement radical policies by moving, simply moving beyond the nation state. That's impossible. We need internationalism, but that internationalism must be built on controlling uh, state leaders. If you approach it in this way, you can see how we would be different, this position would be different from the right-wing Euroscepticism, um, which is about 
which pretends to be against the capitalist system, but it's not, uh, and wants to use these levers, levers of power to control working people and to promote the interests um, of capital. And in the end, he will not even do that. He will, he will not even do that locally. He will find a way of doing it uh, across uh, borders. One last point that's crucially important though here. If the left will not come up with radical positions that are based on this kind of analysis and that mean something to working people in Europe who feel that the um, transnational institutions of Europe are imposing on them and are, are, are destroying democracy, if the left will not do that, then obviously the right will do it. The right will do it and often the right in Europe uses the language of the left uh, to promote its own agenda. This is the tragedy of what's happening in Europe at the moment. And very simply put, the European left needs strong, radical um, Euroscepticism and it needs it quickly uh, if, it is, if it is to reconnect with working people. Great. Uh, one, one of the main issues uh, of the economic policies implemented in Greece and some other countries is what has been called austerity policies. You already mentioned austerity uh, some minutes ago. Uh, in 2015, you wrote an article in The Guardian entitled, To Beat Austerity, Greece Must Break Free From You. What exactly are the austerity policies and how do they work or don't work uh, uh, in, in, in Greece and other countries. And do you think there is a relation between the austerity policies that destruct some state policies like social welfare and things like that, and the rise of the right-wing xenophobic groups, like austerity helps create this kind of movement? I can start with the last part of your question. It's obvious. Absolutely, there's no question. Austerity is designed to facilitate the rise of the extreme right, particularly as austerity in Europe and elsewhere appears to be a policy that is uh, imposed by the global market, whatever this means, by these great forces, these great impersonal forces out there, which uh, are presented domestically as an objective fact and an objective reality, the world as it is, so working people think that there is this uh, great impersonal enemy out there who imposes these policies on us. And if the left will not uh, fight against it and the right will fight against it, they will go to the right, clearly. If, if, if the left doesn't, won't, will not fight against it on the basis of sovereignty, so yes, uh, uh, the, the people will go to, to the right. That's what's happening uh, in Europe. Now, austerity is... In a, is um, a mix of policies in economic terms. Um, I, I, said, I said this a few minutes ago that the state is fundamental to financialization and to the survival of finance as a dominant ascendant uh, component of um, the modern capitalist economy. Um, This means that state finances uh, are also of great importance for um, how financialized capitalism works. Um, austerity pivots, first of all, on how state finances work. And we've get, we, get a, we have a contradiction, uh, one of the most important contradictions of financialized capitalism. On the one hand, state debt supports the financial markets and states have become enormously indebted. The United States government at the moment is more indebted proportionately than at any time since the end of the Second World War. So austerity is necessary for, 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 for financialization. Uh, uh, sorry, state debt is necessary for, uh, for, for, for financialization. But if that becomes excessive, goes beyond a certain point, then the repayment of debt becomes problematic. And if the state 
relies too much on the issuing of fiat money to support its ability to issue debt, then inflation becomes uh, uh, an issue. And inflation is again hostile to the interests of uh, uh, financial capital or, or the lenders. So this, in a sense, is, the, is a key contradiction of financialized capitalism. It wants the state to be there. It wants the state to borrow. It wants the state to issue money. But, but in doing so, the state also creates dangers for the financial interest. Austerity is the response to that. Austerity is the response to it. Uh, uh, whenever f financial capital uh, or financialized uh, uh, interests begin to think that certain limits uh, have been reached. So you impose control on state uh, expenditure. You try and limit uh, public borrowing. Um, you try and uh, control prices uh, in order to defend and protect the interests of what you perceive to be the interest of financialized um, uh, capital. Uh, the price is paid by working people. Uh, all these policies translate into pain for uh, uh, working people. It's a class-based policy. It's a class-based policy that defends the interest of financialized capitalism. And it will always be there. Um, austerity is integral to um, uh, financialized capitalism, uh, as I've just explained. Uh, I want to change a little bit the subject and talk a little bit about Brazil, because uh, Brazil is in a huge depression, uh, the biggest of its recent history since 2015. Uh, the recession began uh, when the second Dilma government, elected with a left-wing speech, uh, decided to implement some austerity policies that we just talked about. Since the previous developmentist policies had failed in race, uh, the rise of GDP. Uh, now Brazil is facing more than two years in raising unemployment and fall on GDP. Do you think that the Brazilian crisis has anything to do with the Greek crisis, especially regarding the adoption of austerity measures? And what are the similarities and the differences that these two crises have in your view? Um. This is a difficult question. There are similarities, but there are also major uh, di differences. And the major difference is, of course, uh, Brazil is not in a, in a monetary union. Brazil has got uh, uh, some control over its exchange rate, and it can engage in uh, uh, foreign exchange policy, which um, gives it a lot more degrees of freedom compared to Greece, which has got none. Um, Brazil also has access to many other uh, levers of policy, which Greece does not, uh, because it belongs to this very rigid uh, union in, in Europe. Uh, but there are similarities. There are similarities, and it's important to understand. Um, the Greek crisis and the Eurozone crisis began originally as a balance of payment crisis. Balance of payment and uh, public debt crisis. The balance of payments was connected to public debt. Uh, the two combined led to the unfolding of the crisis. Latin America has seen many of these before, uh, types of crises before. This is a type of crisis that we've seen many, many times before. And in some ways, what's happening in Brazil now is, is an attempt to prevent such a crisis from emerging. Um, austerity, which is a policy adopted by financialized uh, oligarchies across many parts of the world, uh, is also a response to this type of um, balance of payments, public debt crisis, um, because it compresses spending, it uh, reduces, presumably, the need of the state to borrow, uh, and therefore it helps uh, rebalance the uh, current account because it compresses in, in, and shrinks the domestic economy consumption, investment, and so on. Um, in Brazil, what I understand is happening essentially is uh, the taking of some of these steps before a crisis emerges. It's the, it's the um, in a sense, uh, you get your retaliation in before, <laughs> before the strike uh, comes. Now, policies of this type work in the interests of 
financialized uh, capital, but not in the interest of working people. There are policies that stabilize the domestic and the external situation by, by, by slowing the economy down, by causing economic pain, by destroying people's lives. I want to stress that because a lot of people say austerity doesn't work. It depends on whose perspective you, you're looking at it from. If you're looking at, it from, looking at it from the perspective of big business and financialized capitalism, it works. If you're looking at it from the perspective of development, growth, working people and so on, it doesn't work. Now, the further difference and the, the, the pronounced difference here with Brazil is that we're in this situation after 10 and more years of reasonable growth, some social progress, transformation of uh, the domestic, uh, um, the practices of the, of the state domestically and so on. We've, we've, we've gone through this successful period in the 2000s and have ended up here. That's the tragedy in the case of Brazil and it's something we find in many other uh, Latin American countries, not just Brazil. Um, here we've got a failure. We've got a failure of the left-wing policies, the uh, alternative policies that were adopted in the previous decade. We've got to be frank about it. These policies delivered benefits for working people to a certain extent, and clearly so in Brazil, but they failed to change the balance of power between capital and labor where it matters. That's why we are where we are. In the end, financialized interests uh, have prevailed. Uh, and that's the lesson we need to take in, in planning uh, alternative policies from now on. Great, because that leads exactly to the next question that I, I would like to make, which is, what do you think are the alternatives to Brazilian Greece in face of this failure of uh, the left-wing policies, failure not in uh, getting the life of people better, but in maintaining it and winning the f political fight with neoliberalism and, and finance. And so what are the alternatives to Brazil and Greece to break free from austerity and rec reconstruct the uh, de development plan in the long run? Is this possible in the financialized capitalism or you have to uh, break totally free of this, this situation? capitalism No successful policy in the medium to long term um, in the interest of workers uh, and the poor is possible without directly challenging financialization. Brazil, Argentina, other Latin American countries demonstrate this very clearly. Important things happened in the previous decade in those countries in favor of working people, but as we just said, if you look at it in the fullness of time, it didn't work. Um, why? Because the aim of policies was not structural enough. Structural in terms of the balance of power in the economy between capital and labor. And that to me means definancializing, definancialization. That must become an important element of what we're looking at. Not simply fighting against neoliberalism, that doesn't mean much. Neoliberalism is an ideology. Of course, we must reject neoliberalism. But reject neoliberalism to do what? We've got to be clear about that. Simply saying that we're anti-neoliberalism is not enough, right? You've got to be in favor of something. In favor of what? And here it seems to me if we think that capitalism has financialized, then definancializing must be an important element of what we propose. Definancializing in this context, to me, means something very, uh, very clear uh, if we bear in mind the three tendencies of financialization that I mentioned to you at the beginning of this uh, discussion. And the first one, the first tendency, says that big commercial and industrial enterprises have become financialized. In other words, they hold large amounts of money, they don't invest it in production or other uh, real activities, it were, and they do financial business. That must change. The, it is this, that's where the change must start from. We need to definancialize uh, the, the productive sector 
Now, that's a new thing. That's a new thing. It's not clear. You know, that's a new thing. That, that's a new challenge for us. And no one knows how to do it or can think of a way of doing it separate from the public sector. The public sector must take the lead in this. The public sector must lead through change of regulation, but also through uh, its own example. It must invest, it must, new, it must start new practices in the productive area, and it must drag the, public, the, the private sector with it to help it definancialize and begin to invest again. Um, this is a grand project, but that's exactly what we're talking about. This, and this is a structural project that will change the balance of power between capital and labor. Along, this line, along these lines, we need public banks, not private banks that have failed, public banks with a new spirit, a new spirit of investment and uh, supporting uh, employment and rising incomes and supporting uh, redistribution of income. And obviously, we need then a range of interventions in uh, the everyday life of people that actually takes away the power of finance. We need public provision in health, public provision in education, public provision in transport and everything else. All these areas in which finance has come in and makes profit, we need to, uh, to, to go against that. That to me is a, is, is, is a broad program of social change, social transformation, and you can find um, an analogy here between Greece, Brazil and other countries. Obviously each country will have its own specificities, but that to me makes sense and that to me is a structural change. If we go down this path, we would have something real to say to working people. Um, and it would be, uh, we would be reinventing the left. This project, finally, is unthinkable without re-establishing sovereignty in the political field and without democracy. It, it, it goes together. It's a new project for the left. That, that, that to me, seems the way to, to, to revitalize the left in many parts of the world. Perfect. I, I would like to, to ask one last question. Uh, actually, uh, what we have been seeing in the last few years is a profound crisis of capitalism all over the world, uh, low growth, high employment, uh, the, the commerce is not growing, uh, and uh, some, even some of the mainstream economists uh, are beginning to challenge some of the neoliberal ide ideology that prevails during the 90s and the, the beginning of the 2000s. Do you think that fi the, the, the finance-led capitalism and uh, its ide ideology, the neoliberal ideology, are in crisis? And if they are in crisis, uh, do you think that the left uh, wing movements are ready to uh, uh, express a real alternative politically and economically to this crisis? I think financialized capitalism is an absurd system. This is, uh, hi historically, this is in one of the worst periods in the development of capitalism. This, this, is, this is ridiculous capitalism. This is a kind of capitalism that survives on uh, making profits out of transacting in financial markets, out of lending to individuals for, to go on holiday to, and, and to build houses, uh, out of playing games in the, in, in the global financial markets and so on. And it's a kind of capitalism that in the mature countries has weakened the uh, productive sector, the secondary sector, and has overemphasized services and so on. It's a capitalism that doesn't provide good jobs, growing employment, uh, rising incomes. It's a very unequal uh, capitalism. It has recreated inequality on a gigantic scale. Uh, it's a capitalism that has created absolute chaos politically across the world as big business uh, runs riot and as the major governments uh, do not seem to be able to provide any kind of political stability. It's, this is manifestly a failing uh, a gl global system. There's no question at all about it. The real problem is not that. Capitalism has always been like this. Uh, it is just, as it gets older now, it, it gets more and more ridiculous. You can only describe it as a ridiculous system uh, right now. The real problem is, of course, the left. 
the left bec uh, in, in the last uh, two to three decades, which has lost its confidence. Uh, the real problem globally is the, the loss of confidence by the left, which you can pretty much uh, pinpoint down to events in the 1970s and 1980s when the workers' movement in Europe and the big, the big workers' parties declined, began to decline in Europe. That's the first thing. And the second is, of course, the, um, the fall of the Berlin Wall and then the, the end of the Eastern Bloc, which has acted as a major ideological blow. It has been a major ideological blow for the left. In that context, much of the left, especially the European left, which has always been one of the most powerful sections of the global left, um, lost its belief in itself and in its own ideas, because that's, that's, that's really the, the, the reality of it. That's, that's truly what's happening. Uh, the left might talk about capitalism being bad and so on, um, but it has lost belief in its fundamental um, uh, ideas and traditions and adopted the kind of politics of identity, the politics of uh, uh, proper speech and all that. These are very important things, very important ideas, but they cannot substitute for class politics and for an understanding, for a class understanding of the world. They cannot. Right? This is a measure of the loss of confidence on the part of the left. What we're engaged in right now, what has begun to emerge slowly since the great crisis, essentially is um, a, 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 a refoundation, refounding of the left, certainly in Europe. Um, that's really what's happening. Um, sections of the left are beginning to come to the realization that uh, what they argued for the last 20, 30 years doesn't work. We need to go further back. We need to rediscover <laughs> uh, the class basis of uh, what we believe in. And we need to assert what we want to do with conviction. The left simply doesn't have conviction anymore uh, in its belief that it can change the world, that it can overthrow capitalism. Unfortunately, the right does. Uh, the left needs to rediscover some of this conviction, and that has slowly started. Now, it will take time. It will take time because we're coming, we're coming up from a very low uh, uh, base, unfortunately. The, the historic shock has been very great. Um, but I remain confident and I remain optimistic. Um, and um, I look forward to greater collaboration and exchange of ideas because the Latin American left will once again have things to teach uh, the European left. So I look forward to uh, um, developing this prospect uh, as time. To, because it's very important for us to understand not only what happens in Europe and Greece, but to listen to, to some researchers and economists that have something new to say and it's radical but it's not bad to be radical especially in times ridiculous times <laughs> like we're living in and thank you very much for your time for your the interview and i hope you have a nice stay in brazil i know you are going to the uh, economical economical uh, congress economic political economical congress and we see each other there. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah.